here at this church, we have a number of formal prayer meetings throughout the week, and I have found that prayer meetings are always encouraging for me. You know, sometimes you go to the prayer meeting and you think, well, this is going to be a boring way to waste an hour. I'm just going to sit there and waste this time. I have found the prayer meetings to always be an encouragement. So I encourage you to come and be a part. There are two English language only prayer meetings. One is on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock. And we have to wrap that one up by 6.15 because I go start youth group then. And the other one is on Wednesday, also at 5 o'clock. And we have to wrap that up by about 10 to 6 because we start Wednesday evening Bible study right after that. So if you would like to be part of one of those, uh, I strongly recommend it. Come and join in and be a part. That is where the real work of the church is done, is in those prayer meetings. And I see the most growth in our congregation when, uh, when the most people possible are involved in those prayer meetings. So, uh, so I recommend coming and being a part of those. Also, um, we will be receiving some new members uh, before the annual meeting. And if that's something you're interested in, full membership in the church, you can come talk to me about that. We are actually in the middle of a membership class. You can come join in. It's actually during youth group time on Sunday evening at 615. So you get like the smallest glimpse of what youth group might look like while also being part of the membership class. It's been really fun. And, um, and once the membership class is over, the youth group is getting together and playing a, a game called Uno No Mercy. And it's pretty epic. So maybe if you come to the membership class, you'll be invited to come and show no mercy in an Uno game as well. I don't know if you guys have played Uno, but this is pretty fantastic. They have like, like cards like Draw 10. It's, it's pretty good. So you, you might want to be part of that. Anyway, today we're going to be looking into Philippians again. And we are going to... What happened? Where's my... Oh, I'm missing a slide there. Huh. What do you know? I'm missing the slide with the scripture on it. It's Philippians chapter 2. And, um, and today we're going to be looking specifically at verses 12 through 16. But I want to read for you chapter 2, starting in the first verse, up to verse 18. It all fits together very well. So here it is, 2 starting in verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross." For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God, who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world, by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, but even if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Let's stop there. Lord, I thank you for preserving for us this letter to the Philippian believers. We can see in it that it, it is a letter for us as well. I pray, Lord, that you would expand our minds, help us to understand more. 
we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So I pray, Lord, that your word would wash over us today and fill in us what we're missing in our understanding. How we thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I have greatly enjoyed this study through Philippians to this point. We have handled a lot of the major topics. As a matter of fact, the rest of the book is going to be uh, some repeats and some applications of these major topics of Philippians, and I have really enjoyed it. I have found that I've been able to, to preach to you two of my favorite styles of sermons. I have been able to preach to you the good, old-fashioned, American evangelical sermon that ends in an altar call, always a favorite, as we have discussed things like the humility of Christ and what we need to be doing in humility of Christ. And I've been able to preach to you some of those wonderful encouragement sermons about our citizenship in heaven and not here that make us leave excited about our faith. Those are always fun. People always smile. There are a couple of other styles of sermons that I preach, one that we probably won't be able to use in this particular application, and one that we're going to be getting into a little bit today, and it's what I would refer to as a didactic style of sermon. Didactic means teaching, bringing some specific doctrine. And in this case, it's, it's doctrine that undergirds the letter to the Philippians. That if you understand, if you can relate to, really makes sense of chapter 2, 1 through 18 in a way that if you don't grasp, you, you just kind of miss something. Like most of these types of teachings, you're going to have to work to apply it in your own life. It'll fit. It'll change the way you think. It'll offer renewing of your mind transformation instead of confirmation or uh, being conformed it'll bring those things to you if you apply it we'll find it right at the root of what we've been looking at we've talked about how philippians is this letter of joy paul says i rejoice you rejoice in philippians i rejoice regardless of circumstances because of what god has done for me and where he has brought me and the truth of who i am in him you rejoice for the same reasons, Paul says. He says we'll find our joy not in our circumstances, but instead in things like our partnership with God. The fact that he has chosen us to partner with him in the work of the gospel. We'll find our joy in our citizenship, that we are not citizens of this world, but that we are citizens of another place. And we'll find our joy, surprisingly enough, in our humility as we give ourselves away for Christ and for those around us. We have looked at those concepts but we've really missed something. And I think we'll find it most as we consider the concept of citizenship once again, just briefly. The problem with citizenship is we already think we know about it. We already think we know what it means. I have a U.S. passport. I can go to almost any country in the world with my U.S. passport when I show up at customs, I show them my U.S. passport and they say, oh, you're a U.S. citizen. Acceptable. Come on in. They stamp, I come on in. I'm there in that country for a while and I want to go home. I show them my U.S. passport and they say, oh, you are approved to go home. I come back to the United States, show them my passport. They let me in. Citizenship. I have rights and privileges and responsibilities. I filled out a voter's uh, paper, uh, was it last week? Just like the rest of you. It's a, it's a privilege and a responsibility of my citizenship here in the United States. I am a protected individual citizen of the United States. And when we hear about our citizenship in Christ, we think of something remarkably similar but is that really how that kind of citizenship works? That I have made an allegiance to Christ, that I have gotten my heavenly passport, as it were, that I belong to that other kingdom, and as part of that other kingdom, there are certain rights and privileges and responsibilities that I have that I must carry out. See, when we think of citizenship, we think of it in the concept of laws. 
I remember a few years back, one particular president made a guffaw in a public statement. He said, we are a nation of citizens. And everybody jumped all over him and said, that doesn't make any sense. He said, we're a nation of laws. We have a list of rules. We follow those rules. We are therefore a nation. As soon as we quit following that list of rules, then we are therefore no longer a nation and society falls apart. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I goofed. Yeah, we're a nation of laws. And, and we tend to project that onto what we read here. And when we read things like do nothing with grumbling and complaining, we say, well, that's a rule that we must follow. And if I'm going to be a citizen of heaven, then I can't grumble and argue and complain because that's one of those rules. But that's not, that's not the heart of what Paul is telling us. We really struggle because we have a, a view of society that the biblical authors did not have. We see society in terms of guilt and innocence. We see this concept that there's this list of rules, and if you follow the rules, you are innocent and therefore acceptable, and if you don't follow the rules, you are guilty and must be punished. And when we don't follow the rules, we feel guilty, even if we feel like it was justified, even if we don't care what the speed limit says. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we're like, yeah, I broke that rule, probably shouldn't have done that. That's not how the biblical authors thought. They came from a totally different societal framework. This idea of more of an honor and shame society. This will... This will really stretch your mind, and there's no way that we can encapsulate this in a few minutes on a Sunday morning. But let's try to get into the mind of an honor-shame society just a little bit. In an honor-shame society, the rules really don't matter that much. It really doesn't matter if you are guilty or innocent. What matters is this quantity of honor that's available. It's a limited quantity. And when you are born, you are issued a limited quantity of that honor, and it matches the quantity of the honor that your family and your community has. And you must protect that honor and grow it if you can, and you must not shame it. You remember that Jesus was raised in Nazareth. And you remember that in John chapter 1, Philip introduces Jesus to Nathanael, and he says, this is the Messiah, Jesus, of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? He's not joking. He's not making some kind of snide comment. He's not merely saying that Jesus must be a hick. What he's saying is, the people of the town of Nazareth have no honor. They are a shameful people. So it doesn't matter who comes from there. It could be the Virgin Mary, and she still has no honor. She lives in shame. And you can't, you can't really do anything about that. That's just, that's just what you're stuck with. That's the way an honor-shame society works. And in an honor-shame society, everybody knows about everybody. I, I read a, a story that it described this a couple weeks ago. I was telling Wendy about, uh, I was reading about a, a man who had uh, served at a Bible college in Indonesia. And while he was there, uh, people thought of him as a pastor. And they would, you know, come to him and want to discuss things with him. And one day, a, a, a man and a woman came for some level of marriage counseling. And you see, the problem was the man had been unfaithful to his wife. He had committed adultery. And so they sit down there, and the pastor's thinking, okay, I know what to do here. we got to work through forgiveness. we got to work through reconciliation. we got to work through levels of restitution. we got to try to fix this marriage because the man has broken his vows. He's broken his marriage vows, and he's broken the trust between them. That wasn't the problem at all. Neither one of them cared about any of that. The idea of broken vows didn't matter to them at all. The problem was, she said, where can I show my face? Because he's brought such shame on the family. Man, it's hard for us to to grasp this concept. But I'm seeing that even our own culture is becoming a little bit more honor-shame based. I don't know if you remember this guy. His name is Gary Hart. He was a presidential candidate on the Democrat ticket 
1984 and in 1988. Now, in 1984, Lindsay's like, I don't know who that was. A lot of people said, I don't know who that guy is, Gary Hart. He was a senator. He was an ambassador. He did some other stuff. He was pretty well thought of. He was pretty powerful in the Senate. People generally liked him. He was young and strong. They thought maybe he'd be a good candidate, but of course, he was going up against Ronald Reagan, the most popular modern president of all time. So that wasn't going to work. So in 1988, he was pushed to the ticket again, and it was thought that he would carry away the Democrat nomination without a problem. He was popular, he was strong, and he was going up against George H.W. Bush, who was seen as a little bit too old and a little bit too out of touch. And this guy was young and attractive and a powerful individual, and he was really on his way to the White House until a photograph surfaced of him with a young lady named Donna Rice, one of his campaign aides with whom he was having an illicit affair. Now, this wasn't his first affair. He's a politician. This was the first time he'd been publicly shamed. And as soon as it came out that he was having this affair, he was off the ticket. We're not going to have somebody who is shamed running for the White House. At least they cared about that back in 1988. Maybe you remember this guy, John DeLorean. John DeLorean worked for General Motors. He saved Pontiac. This man single-handedly saved Pontiac. When he was done with that, he single-handedly saved Chevrolet. This guy kept General Motors at the forefront of the auto industry for decades. When he was done with that, he went and started his own car company. I don't think we have any idea how difficult it is to start your own car company. Do you realize that since World War I, there has only been one successful automobile startup come out of the United States, and that's Tesla? There have been a lot of trials. This guy got farther than most. He actually produced cars for a couple years. The DeLorean cars, like in Back to the Future. This guy, he was a jet setter. He was a, he, everybody wanted to be John DeLorean. Until he got caught up in the sting operation where the FBI accused him of trafficking in cocaine. Now, we still don't know. We still don't know. We as the public have no idea whether this guy was guilty or not. A jury found him innocent. However, he was charged with that and it was a very public trial. And I can picture it. I was just a little guy and I can still picture in my mind the news scene of him walking out of the courtroom and getting into the FBI van to go off to jail before he was found innocent. He was shamed. And because he was shamed, people quit investing in his car company and nobody bought his cars and he hasn't sold anything since. Maybe you know this lady. I know Lindsay knows this lady, Gina Carano. She played in The Mandalorian, Lindsay's favorite Star Wars show. She played in The Mandalorian, and she was a very popular character, and everything was great until she made some statements on Twitter that were, well, let's just say decidedly right-wing statements about her personal political views. Disney came to her and said, you need to apologize for that. And she said, that's just my, that's my opinion. That's my political opinion. I can can have a political opinion. And they said, no, you can't. And they fired her and they eliminated her character and they kicked her out of Hollywood and she has not had a Hollywood job since. Or maybe this lady, J.K. Rowling. She wrote the very popular Harry Potter series and was the most popular author on the planet for some time. You seen any books published by her lately? The reason you haven't is because she, who has been known as a liberal feminist activist for decades, she made the mistake of saying on Twitter that only females can menstruate. Seems like a, I mean, it's, I mean, if you follow the biological definition of her terms, she didn't say anything wrong. She just, she just, she made that, made that comment in response to another comment on, on Twitter. And she was entirely and completely blacklisted. She has been removed from all of her feminist activists' posts. And she was uh, released by her publisher and has not had a book published since. Or maybe you remember this guy, Will Smith. I grew up with Will Smith. I mean, not personally, but I was a big Fresh Prince of Bel-Air fan. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were 
my favorite rap stars. Watch this guy's career. Pretty cool guy. Got married, had a couple kids. A couple years ago, Chris Rock, a comedian known for, uh, let's say, pushing the boundaries, at a very public venue, made some very inappropriate jokes about Will Smith's wife. So he walked up on stage and slapped the guy. I personally thought that was a great response. Honestly, i got to be honest with you. This guy is publicly shaming Will Smith's wife. Defend her honor. I thought that was great. Apparently nobody else did because he was completely removed from all public positions. He's been fired by everything. He's been completely and totally blacklisted. And it's not just him. Chris Pratt is another one. Chris Pratt was a, man, he was on his way up. He was a Marvel actor. I don't, I don't know what he played, but I know he was a very popular Marvel guy and very well-known, well-paid actor. Chris Pratt was fired by his movie company because Chris Pratt, hold on, just, Chris Pratt is a Republican. And when they found out, they fired him. I'm not kidding. And not just public figures. This guy's name is David Flynn. He was a high school football coach for Deenham High School in Massachusetts. He's a very popular coach. Very good team. He had some kids in the middle school. And there was a particular teacher in the middle school that espoused some pretty radical political views. And this teacher began uh, impressing these political views on her students, even though they had nothing to do with the the class she was teaching. It wasn't like a a class about political science or something where it would make sense. She was just bringing these political views to class. And Mr. Flynn didn't feel like that was appropriate And so he followed the proper channels, including talking to the teacher and then talking to the administration. And the administration asked him to write a letter. And so he wrote a letter about this and submitted it to the administration and the school board. And he was subsequently fired for presenting his own, they said, opposing political views. In our culture, we have a word for this, and it's not shamed, it's canceled. They were canceled. They didn't fit what society at large was doing. They didn't fit the current narrative of society. Whether conservative or liberal, it doesn't matter. Whether democratic or republican, whether progressive or regressive, it doesn't matter. These are people from all over the spectrum. But each one of them took a moment to speak out in a way that went against the cultural tide at the time, and each one of them was canceled. We can understand just a little bit of this honor-shame concept because of that. That we all have a certain amount of honor, and it's extremely important. And when we lose that, we are sidelined. Now, not only did the biblical writers write out of the honor-shame perspective, they also wrote out of, out of a perspective of collectivism. We are an individualistic culture. I don't expect anybody to write all of this down. I actually got this from a prof who teaches this uh, concept in a sociology class at a college. It's, a really, it's really good information if you want it. It does a good job of breaking down individualism and collectivism. But really, all we need to see is what's right at the top. Individualism prioritizes the rights, independence, and self-interests of individuals. Go America. That's the way we live. That's individualism. Nothing wrong with it. That is the way that we are. However, collectivism emphasizes the well-being or community as a whole. So if I as an individual need to pay a price for the good of the community as a whole, it's not a sacrifice. It's just what you do. That's that's just how it's done. You, you You don't even stop and think about what you're giving away. The biblical authors wrote from a collectivist concept. And in the collectivist concept, the worst thing that can happen to you as an individual is being removed from the collective. Let me give you an example. Do you remember in John chapter 9 where Jesus heals the blind guy? Man who'd been blind from birth, 
Jesus comes along and heals him. Nobody minds that so much. Problem is, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus healed him. Now, the reason that it was a problem that it was the Sabbath day was because there were a group of religious leaders who'd been going around for generations telling everybody, you absolutely may not work on the Sabbath day. And their honor was tied to this concept. We are honorable people who are uh, uh, producing for you the Scriptures and uh, interpreting for you the Scriptures in an honest way. Jesus comes along and says, no, you're not. Jesus is publicly shaming them by working on the Sabbath day in their minds, and they want their honor back. That, incidentally, is why Jesus was crucified. Was, he could have been killed a lot of different ways, but they wanted a very public way of killing him so that they would take any honor from him and leave him only with shame. Nonetheless, in this story, Jesus has healed this man who's been born blind. He healed him on the Sabbath day. The man was called to testify before the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court. They said, what do you know about this man, Jesus? He said, all I know is I once was blind, now I see. They called his parents in to testify. They said, is this your son? They said, yes. They said, was he born blind? They said, yes. They said, how does he now see? Now here's the clincher. His parents knew that anybody who supported Jesus would be kicked out of the synagogue. They'd already said this. The, 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 the leaders of the day had already said this. Now, to be kicked out of the synagogue does not mean, well, I'm going to have to go find a different church. To be kicked out of the synagogue means excommunicated from society. You no longer are part of that collective. You can no longer get a job in society. You can no longer do any business with anyone in society. You can no longer associate with your friends and family and relatives that are in society. They don't want you. You don't want them. It's like you have died. You have been turned out on your own. There is nowhere you to, for you to go. And in a collectivist society like this, it's not like you can just sell stuff on Etsy to make money. You're done. So when they said, what happened to him to make him see, the, the mom and dad said, I don't know. He's old enough. Let him testify. Don't get us involved in this. Now they did know. Jesus had healed their son. And we would say, well, they really backed down. They should have stood up for Jesus. He did a great thing for them. Small price to pay for what Jesus has done for them. No, you don't understand. For them, it was everything. This was not a small price. This was everything. They called the man back in and said, tell us about this Jesus. We know he's a sinner. He said, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. He shamed them. So what did they do? They kicked him out of the synagogue. And you'll see that Jesus comes back around to him and finds him to comfort him in this moment. He might be able to see, but now he's as good as dead. Do you get this concept? Difficult for us to understand, but it plays so deeply into the story of Philippi. Remember that the people of Philippi were Roman citizens. They were the first Roman imperial citizens, they were incredibly proud of their citizenship. Much more than you are proud of your national citizenship, this wasn't just the country these people were from or their homeland. This was their very identity. The collective that they belonged to was the collective of the Philippian people. It was something that they were born with. If they are going to join uh, the Christian church, if they're going to follow the, mo the movement of Christ, they have to give that up. Interesting to think that the very first Christian convert was Lydia, who was not Philippian in this town. She was Thyatiran. He didn't gain any Philippian converts until after the whole jailer deal, and that's really interesting in and of itself. Now you remember the story. Peter, or pardon me, Paul and Silas and the guys, they've been going down to a place of prayer and they've been leading Bible studies there, and a young lady's been following them who is a slave who is demon-possessed. She's twice tortured. She's a slave, and she's a demon-possessed. And Paul sets her free, and nobody cares. Nobody cares that this girl who's been oppressed by, by man and by spirit is free. All they care about is Paul has messed up the society. He has brought shame on the owners by messing up the society. Since he has brought shame on them, they're going to bring shame on him. So they take him, strip him naked, beat him in public, he and Silas both, and throw them into the worst possible jail. This wasn't a matter of a punitive causing them injury for, for punishment. 
This was to bestow shame upon them. Now, of course, God frees them from that. You remember that the jailer gets saved, his whole family. Interestingly enough, Lydia and her whole family get saved. The jailer and his whole family get saved because it's a collectivist society. If one person's going to do it, that means we are all doing it. Any decision that's made is an us decision, not a me decision. They both get saved. They get to know Christ. They're involved in the church. The very next day, the magistrates send note to the jailer saying, let those guys go. Basically, they've been publicly shamed. The job is done. Just get them out of city. I don't really care what happens to them after this. And Paul says, no, I'm not going to go. I was publicly shamed. They've taken my honor. And I'm a Roman citizen. They had no right to do that. So I want my honor back. So send the magistrates themselves to escort me out of town. And in doing so, the magistrates are then having to take the shame that they gave him on themselves. They're having to humble themselves and come and lead him out. And the only reason they did that was because, of course, he and Silas were Roman citizens. Now remember, he didn't just leave town. He went back to the church with the magistrates with him, escorting him out of town. Hold on, we're going to go see the jailer, and we're going to go see Lydia, and I'm going to encourage the church. Why? I'll tell you why. Because in joining with Christ who was publicly shamed by being hung on a cross, the ultimate form of shame in that society. In both the Jewish society and the Roman society, that was the most shameful thing that could happen. In associating with Christ, they are associating with his shame. They're taking that on themselves. And Paul wants the Philippian magistrates to come and lead him to them as a way of removing some of that shame. So that now they are a legitimate group of people inside the city of Philippi. Now it gets even more interesting when you go right to the very first couple of verses of this letter where Paul says to the saints of Christ at Philippi. They used to be Philippians. Now they are Christians at Philippi. Their citizenship has changed. The collective with which they are a part has changed. Take that into mind as we look at these verses. Oh, that's just introduction. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get out in time for the Daytona 500 because it's been moved till tomorrow. Take that in mind as we look at this. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to work and will according to his good purpose. Now hold on. When you read this, you think of it individually. He's talking to you. But remember, all of the yous are plural. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you all have always collectively obeyed as a group, what is the therefore? He's talking about what Jesus did. How Jesus humbled himself. How Jesus gave away all of his honor, assumed the greatest form of shame, only to have God give him back his honor. He did that in obedience to the will of the Father, and you, my whole group of believers together, have collectively obeyed just like that when I was with you. You collectively assumed the shame of Christ by the will of the Father so that He can give you great glory. Think about the situation with the magistrates coming back to them to return their shame, or to return their honor to them. You have always obeyed when I was with you. You did it like that, and now that I'm not with you, you as a collective, still do the same thing. You all together need to work out all y'all's own salvation with fear and trembling. We talked about this verse last week and we looked at it from a very individualistic level last week, but consider it as the church. We talked about what it means to work out. This is effort that you put in to use what God has given you for his good. As a church, as a collective, all of us working together on this because God is working in all of us together because God has a plan for all of us together. He has an idea of what this church ought to look like. He has equipped this church with everything that it needs to be what it ought to be. He's given us all of the capability to do this. Now we, as a church, have to get together and do the work necessary to strengthen that and make it go. That's His good purpose for us. So, all y'all do everything without grumbling 
and arguing. You know, I honestly thought about just doing the whole sermon right on that. I mean, I'd be preaching to me. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. You guys know what grumbling is. You can't believe I got to put up with this. this is a bunch of junk. All I wanted to do was ride my motorcycle all week, and instead the weather's got to be horrible. What's the matter with this? How many times do you? I'm, come on, can we just be honest for a minute? When's the last time you waited in line at a grocery store? Did you grumble? Let's just be honest. All these stinking self-checkouts and I still got to wait in line to do all the work myself. What's the matter with this? I should go sit in the break room after this because I'm having to be my own employee. Somebody else comes up to you and says, hey, how's it going? And you're like, can you believe the rain out there? What's a, it's supposed to be a nice day today and there's rain out here. I had stuff I wanted to do. I'm telling, I, listen, I find this incredibly convicting because I've been grumbling a lot the last couple weeks. I've been having quite the pity party for myself the last couple weeks. I've examined the last 10 years. Today actually marks a very special 10-year anniversary in my ministry. And as I've thought about the last 10 years and as I've thought about the last six years here, I feel like I have a lot to complain about. And so I've been grumbling. And some of you have made the mistake of asking me, and I've just unloaded on you. Well, that's... You're not supposed to do that. Don't, don't do that. And, and don't argue. There's two aspects to the word argue here. And the largest aspect is private. Arguing within yourself. That is, doubting what you know is true and convincing yourself otherwise. Not questioning things to try and find the truth. All right? The Bible, the Bible is never never against questioning things to find the truth. The Bible is very much asking you to dig in and discover the truth. No, this is when you already know something is true, and yet you question it in yourself because you don't like that truth. You know, like the little kid whose mom says you need to eat your dinner or you're going to be hungry later, and they know that, but they want to throw a fit about it anyway. The problem is that extends out from you to arguing with one another. Now let's put this into the collective mindset for a moment. We are a, a collective group. We are concerned about the honor of the group. If we are grumbling amongst ourselves, it's like rust in metal. It's like rot. It rots the group apart. We can't stay a collective if we are arguing, if we are uh, grumbling in ourselves. And arguing, arguing is an incredibly individualistic thing. I only argue with you because I think my opinion is better than yours. Rather than considering what's best for all of us together, I got to have my opinion. Even if it tears the group apart, I expect to have my opinion. Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't grumble and argue. Why? So that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverse generation. Let's talk about those two words, crooked and perverse. They are exactly that. The idea of being straight or being bent has existed in most societies, linguists, for some time. And this is what Paul is talking about. We have the chance to be straight like an arrow, or we have a chance to be bent up like a river. And the people around you, he says, are morally and intellectually bent up like a river. And they are perverse. That means taking something that's to be used one way and using it another way. And of course, in our minds and in Paul's, that applied directly to issues like sexual immorality. There's a particular way to use that, and it's been twisted into another way. He says you're living in a group of people who are not straight, they are crooked, and who are not right, they are perverse. But you should be blameless and pure. You should be straight, using things correctly as they were planned. Because, of course, that's what God is. And you are His children. Think about the honor-shame system there. You are His children. He has given you this honor. You are to carry on this honor by behaving in this particular way. And then you'll be found faultless. You won't be considered wrong. Now, here's the, here's the problem. In our minds, we immediately go back to the list of rules. Oh, I'm going to be blameless and pure. I'm going to follow all the rules. 
That's a real struggle because that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the collective group. Because the collective group, he said, should shine like stars. You guys have looked up at the night sky. Around here, you really don't see too many stars. But if you go somewhere where you can see them, there's this black background, and there's all these little points of light. The black background is expansive. But then there's all these little points of light. And what do you see? You don't see the black background. You see the points of light. He said that's how the church should be. When the people of the world look at the world, what they see is the blackness of the world. But shining out from that blackness of the world are all of these points of light. And they are not individuals who have an individual relationship with Christ. They are the church. Interesting information. What in the world are we supposed to do with it here at Mount Vernon Church of the Nazarene? Listen, if you can grasp this concept or these concepts, it will change the way you read the Bible. It will expand your mind, help to transform your mind to really understand what the message of the Bible is saying, and that's great, but what does that mean to us here at Mount Vernon Church of the Nazarene? I mean, the difference between a teaching and a sermon is application, right? How do we apply this kind of thought? Well, it's it's really pretty simple. First of all, we have to remember that we are a community. We have the tendency to think of ourselves as individuals who choose to come to church rather than to think of ourselves as the church or as part of the church. Remember in Matthew 16 where Jesus says to Peter on this rock, I will build my church. It's the first mention of that term in the New Testament, that term church. Some of you who know, who've been hanging around the church for a little while know that that word is the word ecclesia and it literally means assembly or group of people pulled together for a purpose the church is a group of people made one one individual group for a specific purpose something that god is building we need to shift our mindset from saying the church is for me or about me or to help me meet my needs, or to help me overcome the problems that I am, to the church is a collective group of people shining the honor of God. Now in that, I get a lot of support. That's the first thing that we need to grasp, is that this is a community. And the second thing we need to grasp is that this community should look different. Have you thought about the word community before? Have you ever considered that? It's a, con- it's a contraction. I don't know if you've ever thought about the word it's it's a, it's a contraction of the words common and unity we have some things in common around those things we are united common unity we are a community and as a community those things around us that unite us should make us look different than the community that is not the church i mean if if the church reflects its community it's It's just being the greater community. It's not something different. What are the things that we have in common that unite us? Well, of course, we talk about those every Sunday and Wednesday and every time we can in the Bible, but Peter says it this way, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You've got to do two things. Remember that the you is plural, that this is collective, And remember that he's not talking about breaking the rules. He's not saying you individually need to make sure that you always follow the speed limit and never break it because that's the rule. That way the people outside the church will say, wow, that individual Christian is doing a great job following the rules. That's what we'd like to think. But he's saying you as the community live in such a way that is honorable to the honor of God. That even though they're going to accuse you of being shameful people because you associate with Christ who has been shamed, you live so greatly within the honor of God that all they end up seeing is the honor of God. And further, we are to live in a way that strengthens our community. This is where the individual gets involved. We have some folks in our community that are really hurting with some various things. We have some single moms that are struggling with some 
tough situations. We have some folks that are really struggling financially. We have a number of folks that are struggling physically. We have, we have just about anything that you can imagine we have present within our community. So how, is we are, how are we as individuals to live? We're to live in ways that strengthen the whole community. We all rise or fall together. If one person hurts, we all hurt. I remember, um, where was I at? Camp or maybe, I don't remember where I was. Wendy broke her toe. She got up in the middle of the night. She was walking through the house and she walked into something and broke her toe. It's just one little dinky little toe. Just the, one, the end one, I think on her left foot, the le- very last one. What's that matter? I mean, you guys probably even forgot you had that toe until I mentioned it just now. I mean, how often does that matter to anything? Well, it doesn't until the minute you break it. And then it affects your entire body. I mean, Wendy was laid up because of this broken little toe. I told her every time I leave, she does something like, I gotta quit leaving, going anywhere, take her with me. I took her to camp with me as a result. It's that way in the church. How many times do we think about one of the individuals in the church? I don't know, I mean... We like them and we hang out with them. That's great. But when we see that they're hurting, we all react. We all come together and hold them up. Whatever that looks like. Physical, financial, emotional, mostly spiritual. We all come together and react. Because like Paul says, we're one body. Like Peter says, we're, we're all stones being built into a common temple. Or like it says in Philippians 2.4, everyone should look out not only to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Man, if we were all taking care of all of our needs, your individual needs wouldn't be that big of a deal. If we were all getting together to take care of everything that all, I mean, if we knew each other that well, something goes wrong, it goes wrong. I got a whole group of people to support me. And then finally, oh, don't forget this one. Speaking of the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, even Christ. This is out of Ephesians 4. For from him the whole body, fitted in it together by every supporting ligament, pr- promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. The body growing together. And then finally, we are expected to find our joy within the community. What Christ has done for us is a communal salvation. Yes, it's individual. Yes, He saved you individually. Yes, you can have a personal relationship with Him. However, He did it all at once. He saved us within the community. And that's where we're to find our joy. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, we didn't quite get there today, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should be glad and rejoice with me. We are all rejoicing together. There are some styles of sermon I I really do like preaching. I think my favorite style is uh, when I just get to tell you a story. When I get to find a story in the scripture and just explain that story to you, and as I explain the story, you begin to take on the application and it affects your hearts. I really enjoy that. My least favorite style is didactic, like this. Because, Because we don't get to the point. There's no altar call. You have to take this home and chew on it for a while. What does it mean that we are points of light in a crooked and perverse generation? What does it mean that we are this community that's been pulled together and in this community we'll find our joy? What do we have to do to become that kind of community? Well, that's up to you. I just just present it to you and and you've got to figure it out. So let's take a moment. Let's pray. Let's ask the Spirit to work in our mind and heart and see what he does. Lord, how we thank you that you have called us to be something different.